On this Thursday night, Donald Trump may have reversed course on separating families, but confusion reigned today at the U.S.-Mexico border. We'll look at why the problem isn't going to be solved so easily. Also, why the First Lady's wardrobe caused such an uproar. Plus, we take the issue to hardcore Trump supporters. Also tonight, a special season finale edition of that issue, the state of Canada-U.S. relations and the state of Canada's three main federal parties, their challenges and opportunities. Because just a reminder, Canada votes in 16 months. This is The National. Confusion and chaos. That's how scenes at the U.S. border with Mexico were being described today. Officials seem stymied by yesterday's abrupt policy reversal to now stop separating migrant children from their families, not to mention the continuing turmoil involving the children who are already in custody. And no one seems to know how or when they'll be returned to their parents. This is a moral crisis. This is a humanitarian crisis. Crisis. Today, mayors from all over the U.S. tried to meet some of those children at a holding facility in Texas. They were denied entry, but banded together to draw more attention to the kids' trauma, emotional and physical. Some have lice, some have bed bugs, uh, chicken pox, all sorts of uh, contagious situations. Meanwhile, in Washington, U.S. lawmakers were unable to help, voting down one immigration bill, kicking another one over until next week. And added to all of that, enter the president's wife on a mission to show the Trump family's softer side with a visit to a children's detention facility. But it turned into a lesson in what not to wear. Here's Stephen D'Souza. A day after her husband's stunning reversal, Melania Trump made a surprise visit to Texas, a trip her office says she planned before the president's executive order that keeps together migrant families detained at the border. I also like to ask you how I can help to these children to reunite with their families uh, in a, as quickly as possible. That was a question many were asking. Just how the more than 2,300 children already separated from their families will be reunited. In terms of logistics, I think it's going to be something that will be a nightmare for CBP, ORR and ICE to be able to work out. Compounding the problem? Those separated children have been spread across the country. More than 300 were sent to New York City, including this group that arrived late last night. Frankly, we have to house them and we should be taking good care of them and then we should return them back home. Today, the president insisted that anyone crossing the border illegally will be prosecuted. If we took zero tolerance away, you would be overrun as a, you'd have millions of people pouring through our border. But at the border, it appears the zero tolerance policy may be partly on hold. In a Texas courthouse, this group of 17 migrants had their charges withdrawn, all crossed illegally with children. And in a statement to CBC News, Customs and Border Protection said it would still refer adults crossing the border illegally for prosecution, no mention of families. So exactly what's happening to migrant adults with children isn't known. On a day already full of confusing and contradictory messages, the most puzzling one came from Melania Trump. As she left for her Texas trip, she wore a green jacket with the words, I really don't care, do you? scrawled on the back. If there was any doubt it was deliberate, she wore the jacket again when she returned from the trip. Now asked about her wardrobe, Melania Trump's communications director said, it's just a jacket there's no message there. But hours later, Donald Trump tweeted that there was a message. He wrote, I really don't care, do you? Written on, written on the back of Melania's jacket refers to the fake news media. Melania has learned how dishonest they are, and she truly no longer cares. Okay, Steve, also not the first time that a member of the Trump family has caused some outrage when it comes to this story. That's right. Ivanka Trump at the end of May tweeted a photo of her and her toddler just as the stories of migrant children being ripped from their families were emerging. And it's not just the family itself. The administration also gets into hot water from time to time. On Tuesday, the State Department did a poorly timed Q&A about families traveling with their kids. And while there are many other examples of the Trump administration being out of sync with the national conversation, 
Trump himself did show some sensitivity yesterday. Just before signing the executive order, Rosie, he did cancel today's congressional picnic, saying it just didn't feel right. Okay, Stephen, thank you. The CBC's Stephen D'Souza, he's in Washington tonight. So, of course, the question is, will any of this hurt the president politically? For many Trump voters, illegal immigration was actually the single biggest issue. We sent our Paul Hunter down to Virginia to talk with some diehard supporters. And as he discovered, it's hard to find much outrage there. Just to give you a sense of where we are, Stanley, Virginia is... Trump country. We came here this afternoon to spend a little time with people to get a sense of, you know, where their heads are at on Trump, given the heat he's taken lately on immigration. And what we heard basically echoes the language of Trump. The border must be secured effectively at any cost. Yes, there's sympathy for the migrants, but only to a point. We sat down with a woman named Kim Foltz, who we ran into in her front yard, uh, poolside with her family to talk about Trump and specifically the issue of family separation at the border. Families maybe shouldn't be separated, but the parents know this when they're bringing their kids all these ways to the border, the consequences. And that's not Trump's fault that they choose to go there. And he's not perfect, that's for sure. But I just think it's been since day one and, and him being in office, it's just been negativity towards him. And I mean, I just, I think he deserves a fair chance like everybody else. So some sympathy for the migrants, but also for Trump. Just down the street from here, one of those good old American diners, and we sat down with two lifelong friends who were having lunch together, and we talked Trump, immigration, and that border wall. They should build the wall. If there's a protocol for coming into this country, it needs to be followed. And I, I feel really sorry for people that are so desperate that they, they try to go around it. But it's the law is there, the wall is there for a reason. We've got to stop them from coming in. No matter how you do it or what it takes, we got to stop them. I mean, uh, you can't have the melting pot of the world all the time. So uh, I support whatever decision he makes. The bottom line, everyone we sat down with today voted for donald trump in 2016 and despite all the heat he's taken lately on immigration an issue that is key for everyone here they would vote for him again tomorrow if they could paul hunter cbc news stanley virginia Okay, so there you go. This battle over the border has landed President Trump back on the cover of Time magazine, where he has actually appeared more than 20 times over the years. Trump has a long obsession with being on the cover of Time, but he probably won't love this upcoming appearance, since it also features the now famous image of a two-year-old Honduran girl sobbing while her mother is detained. Trump looms confidently over her. The caption, Welcome to America. This issue comes out the week of July 2nd, just before Independence Day. Here's a quick look at what else we're working on tonight on The National. Taking a hard look at the glowing reference letter written for Elizabeth Wetloff, the nurse who killed eight people. The union that had once advocated for her today faced questions at the public inquiry into her actions. We were there. And it's the season finale of that issue. Tonight, a special two-part panel as we look at Canada-U.S. relations and answer some of your questions. But first, across the country, a celebration of National Indigenous Peoples Day. It's something Canadians have been taking part in for more than two decades, an opportunity to learn and to show respect, but also a chance to reflect on a history that is far from healed. In 1996, a proclamation was signed creating a day that honors and celebrates First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Now, every June 21st is National Indigenous Peoples Day. It started early this morning in St. John's with a sunrise service to remember the last of the Beothic people. At a daycare, the experience was firsthand. Youngsters giving throat singing a try. <laughs> Ottawa greeted the day in the shadow of Parliament Hill with a circle dance, and later two new flags of the Algonquins took a permanent place over City Hall. 
Toronto's Fort York was turned into an outdoor classroom with Indigenous dancing, painting and crafts. We raise a little bit of cultural awareness here so that the youth are taking that knowledge home and learning about Indigenous people all of the time, not just here at the festival, but they're taking that knowledge outside of these fort walls. In Winnipeg, the day was used to bring attention to the stories of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. And at this Yellowknife fish fry, it was all about the food and keeping up with the hungry crowds. Happy Indigenous People Day. But just under the surface, no one would dispute there are still challenges for many Indigenous people. And tonight, we want to zero in on two of them. The first deals with their connection to the land and how it's being protected. The other goes straight to the most senior levels of Quebec's government after the health minister there made some offensive comments. Let's start with the prime minister. He marked the day by announcing an environmental partnership with 14 First Nations on the West Coast. But the plan is getting mixed reviews, in part because it comes in the midst of the Trans Mountain Pipeline debate. The CBC's Renee Filipponi was in Prince Rupert as Justin Trudeau met with Indigenous elders. The framework agreement outlines how we'll engage on a nation-to-nation -nation basis going forward as we develop the policies and practices that will guide us in managing these waters, which span about two-thirds of the B.C. coast. This move is part of the government's Oceans Protection Plan, aimed at guarding against spills, protecting whale habitats, and enabling trade. Uh, we have run aground here at uh, the Fourth Channel. It was announced back in November 2016, after the Nathan E. Stewart tugboat ran aground near Bella Bella. There's fuel just flowing out of the boat. More than 100,000 litres of diesel fuel spilled into Heltzik First Nation territorial waters. Today's move will give First Nations a formal role in marine response, which is welcome news because they are often the first responders in a disaster. For us to have an agreement um, that will you know, provide for that foundation to be able to uh, ensure that protection is there into the future is, is a big day. Tom Gunton is a professor of resource and environmental management. He says this plan doesn't make sense when the Liberal government is pushing ahead with the Trans Mountain Expansion Project in the South. This announcement illustrates the inconsistency uh, with the federal government's approach of protecting the North Coast uh, by a tanker moratorium and all of these additional measures, while at the same time putting BC's South Coast at risk by a sevenfold increase in tanker traffic. It's unclear how much of the $1.5 billion for the Oceans Protection Plan will go to the 14 First Nations. There was no new money announced today, and there are few details about how the partnerships will work. It will be up to the communities to come up with specific plans. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Prince Rupert. Now to those comments by Quebec's health minister. Tonight, Inuit leaders are demanding his resignation. He was talking in the context of transporting sick children from the north to hospitals further south. But as Jayla Bernstein explains, the controversy is all about the subtext, a long and ugly history of stereotyping. A rule that prevented sick children from traveling with their parents aboard medevac flights has been widely criticized in Quebec. After recent pushback, the government yielded and promised to let parents on board. At a community event at this mosque, the health minister was asked why that hasn't happened yet. CBC obtained a recording of his response, where he guaranteed someone intoxicated will be kicked off of a flight in the next six months. That where someone will not be made allowed, not allowed to get on the plane. Why? Because no one agitated, drug, under whatever influence would get on the plane. Any cause. That will not happen. And that happens all the time. Those words led to a chorus of condemnation. To have comments like that by a minister is uh, totally appalling, appalling and unacceptable. We're going to demand that uh, the minister resign from his position. The head of an organization that represents Inuit in Quebec's north says he needs to apologize and I don't think that will be enough. He needs to go. The trust is gone. 
Bonjour tout le monde. Barrett backpedaled today, at first saying that people wrongly assumed he'd been talking about Indigenous people when he meant it more generally. Then, later, he offered this as an apology. I can understand the sensitivity of that and the reaction, and I apologize for that. Uh, I'm quite sorry about that, but at the end of the day, uh, can we move on? The Premier is standing in solidarity with his health minister as a provincial election looms. I think he is sorry that his words have been interpreted that way. I suggest that we leave it there. Barrett did call the mayor of Kujuak to apologize. The mayor says he does not accept the apology. He's demanding that the minister resign immediately. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. Well, let's look now at some of the other developing stories we're tracking tonight. Starting with damning revelations today at the Elizabeth Wettlofer inquiry in Ontario from the employer who wanted her gone and the union who defended her. Wettlofer began working at the Crescent Care Nursing Home in 2007. There was trouble right from the start. Five suspensions in seven years and hidden at the time the murders of seven patients. Wettlofer was finally fired in 2014, but Caressant never reported any concerns about her performance, instead doing something of the opposite, agreeing to union demands for a reference letter. As John Lancaster explains, she went on to get a new job where she killed her eighth victim. If a registered nurse presents a concern for patient safety, should that nurse continue working in the home? Wanda Saganessi, like other managers at Crescent Care in Woodstock, Ontario, was aware Wettlofer had become a danger to their patients. So they fired her in 2014. But within weeks, the care home reached a settlement with Wettlofer's union, the ONA, Ontario Nurses Association, that prevented a potentially costly and uncertain arbitration process. It was a deal that came with conditions. Are you pleased to provide someone a reference for whom you thought was placing a resident's health at risk? That was not the context uh, or, the, or the thinking. Crescent Care gave Wetlaw for a letter of recommendation, $2,000, and agreed to call the firing a voluntary resignation. Paul Scott represents the families of two of Wetlawfer's victims. You, you must have known that she was then going to go out into the world again and apply for another nursing job somewhere, didn't you? Yes, but that would be the case even if we went to arbitration and won. Either way, the arbitration findings would have been made public, a potential red flag against Wettlaufer. If it wasn't disclosed, how was I supposed to know? The union's Jill Allingham also blamed Caressant Care, accusing the facility of not revealing everything they knew. Yet Allingham conceded the union didn't wait for all the facts before deciding to protect Wettlaufer. Scott wonders if the settlement put the public at risk. You have a staff member on your hands that's not up to being at your uh, residence anymore. Do you really want to then send them back out into the world looking for employment? The inquiry has been told that Wettlaufer went on to find more work and more victims. She injected three more patients with massive amounts of insulin. Two of them survived, a third didn't. Meanwhile, her latest employers never had a full picture of who or what they were dealing with. John Lancaster, CBC News, St. Thomas, Ontario. For the first time since their son committed mass murder, we heard from the parents of Alexandre Bissonnette today, and they had much to say about what he did and why he did it. The 28-year-old pleaded guilty to six counts of first-degree murder after he stormed a Quebec City mosque and opened fire. Sentencing hearings wrapped up today. The Crown wants six back-to-back -back life sentences with no eligibility for parole for 150 years. But while Bissonnette's parents recognize the damage their son has done, they also hope everyone understands his side of the story. I listened to the immense, terrible sadness expressed by the victims and of others. I would like to express to them, once again, in my name, in my family's name, all our compassion, our sympathy with them in this terrible, terrible, terrible ordeal. Alexander is not a monster. The psychiatrist who testified explained the possible causes that brought him to commit this terrible crime. Namely, intensive bullying, 
endured during his years in school. It is well recognized that bullying can cause lifetime mental health problems and lead to suicide and violent acts in extreme cases. Unfortunately, Alexander's mental condition caused by the years of intimidation was not identified by us, nor by the doctors he consulted. So that was their explanation. And just moments before his parents spoke, Alexandre Bissonnette himself addressed the court one last time. He said he, quote, regretted dreadfully what he did and through tears said, my life has caused so much suffering for so many people. He's set to be sentenced on October 29th. And in Toronto today, police say they've dealt a major blow to a violent street gang known as the Five Point Generals. Some 70 people alleged to be affiliated with the group were arrested in overnight raids across the region. Police also seized drugs and guns. We're talking about street gangs, street gangs that, that utilize firearms for business processes and uh, have uh, no hesitation in using firearms. And when we talk about our, our gun play in the city, the street gangs play a, a huge, a massive role in, in that type of activity. The raids were part of a nine-month investigation dubbed Project Patton, and the scope was large, too. The police chief said the gang's activities extended well beyond Toronto to the U.S. and as far as the Caribbean. Police are promising more details tomorrow. Still ahead on The National, meet the newest Marvel Universe superhero. She's from Nunavut. She's Inuk, and she's, well, she's pretty badass. <laughs> Plus, one of the world's most famous gorillas has died. We'll look back at the life of Coco and her ability to communicate through sign language that made her so extraordinary. And of course, it's my favorite night, and maybe yours too. The house has risen, and that issue is about to do the same. After our special season finale session, Chantal, Andrew, and Althea join me where all the business happens right in the foyer of the House of Commons to talk trade, Trump, and Trudeau, and answer, yeah, some of your questions right after this. When the House stops sitting, so does at issue. At least we take a little summer break just like them. It's been my first at issue season, and it's been a great one. Uh, we're going to answer some of your questions tonight, but we're also going to talk about the main topic that has dominated this place, uh, the House of Commons, since January, even before that. That, of course, Canada-U.S. relations and Donald Trump. Let's take a look at some of the biggest moments that have defined that relationship over the past little bit. So I think if there is goodwill on all sides, uh, we could have a great outcome in Montreal. Due to the unique nature of our relationship with Canada and Mexico, we're negotiating right now NAFTA. And we're going to hold off the tariff on those two countries to see whether or not we're able to make the deal. Justin has agreed to cut all tariffs <laughs> and all trade barriers <laughs> between Canada and the United States. So uh, I'm very happy so about I'd say that. NAFTA's in good shape. As Canadians, polite, we're reasonable, but we also will not be pushed around. And by the way, Canada, they like to talk. They're our great neighbor. They fought World War II with us. We appreciate it. They fought World War I with us, and we appreciate it, but we're protecting each other. We have very good relationships with Canada. We have for a long time, and hopefully that'll work out. But Canada's not going to take advantage of the United States any longer. Okay, so lots to talk about, and uh, to do that, joining me in the foyer of the House of Commons, Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. I made them come to me. Look at, you guys actually have legs and whole bodies. You're not just floating <laughs> just heads. Just not heads <laughs> and boxes. Okay, that was, uh, we want to do this first chunk, because we're going to do two chunks tonight, uh, uh, just on that relationship, because it has evolved, deteriorated, changed 16 times, sometimes over the course of a week. Where would you say it is at right now? Uh, deteriorating, deteriorated. Uh, there was a time not so long ago when we were told uh, that one of the big goals of Canada uh, and the Trudeau-Trump relationship was to not be on the president's Twitter feed. Yes. <clears throat> okay, I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew. Yeah, it's hard to know how much of that is based on anything real and how much of that is just Trump's tantrum of the week. 
uh, how much of it is part of his grander ambition of breaking apart most of the Western alliances. Uh, it, it, you get the feeling almost that we were just sort of the, the, the convenient target uh, for, as I say, at this moment, it could be, well, it was Angela Merkel the next week, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's never good when you've got not only the president, but his minions competing to come up with the worst adjectives they can find to describe the prime minister. What about you, Althea? Where do you think that relationship is? What, what defines it right now? I don't think it can not be saved. I agree that it's deteriorated. I think the government spent a great deal of effort trying to basically suck up to Donald Trump. And that only went so far until the president's uh, economic interests clashed against ours. And basically, we weren't ready to fold quite as quickly as Mr. Trump wanted us to. But I don't think it's not salvageable. I mean, you looked at what he tweeted about, you know, the little rocket man. And then, you know, he had a great yeah. summit with the North Korean dictator. Yeah. So I think there are things that will change. And obviously, uh, July 1st and the presidential election in Mexico is a way of, like, restarting negotiations. So as long as you just get through to July, I think. Yeah, the NAFTA. The talks, as far as we know, are still on. So. But I was struck this week when the Prime Minister did his uh, end of session news conference and he was asked, have you spoken with mm -hmm. President yes. Trump since the G7 and the whatever happened? And the answer was no. Uh, and that couple of weeks, that doesn't speak to uh, a lot of bridge rebuilding yet. Although presumably people are talking. It sounded like people behind the scenes uh, were talking. Yes, but... Uh, I think it's unprecedented uh, that a, a U.S. president takes shots directly mm -hmm. uh, by name yeah. at the Prime Minister yeah. of Canada. And I've already said that, too. The other even time. if yeah. there weren't the bad blood, it's just the unpredictability. You never know with Trump, partly because he doesn't know very much and doesn't believe very much and changes his mind three times a day and has a revolving door staff who are oftentimes at war with each other, oftentimes contradicting him. It must be extraordinarily frustrating for any government, including ours, to have to deal with that because sure. you don't know who speaks for the White House or wh what their position will be from day to day. Yeah. Okay. There's yeah, two things I want to say. I actually went back and looked at the at what period in time the Prime Minister and the President actually had talked. They've only really spoken or met nine times since January, and it was always because of usually of an event, either the tariffs or the discussion around the tariffs or the Saskatchewan bus crash or the right. shooting in Florida. Yeah. So unless there's like a news event that the two can agree to meet and then talk about NAFTA or something, we haven't had that. So two weeks not talking is not abnormal. What is noticeable, though, is that the Prime Minister seems to be airing his frustrations with the president in a way that he has not before. And that started in early June when he talked about how basically he was given this ultimatum and he decided not to fold. And that's why he didn't go to D.C. to sign it right. for negotiating NAFTA. But even in the end of sitting press conference where he said, well, you know, the president likes to be unpredictable. The frustrations that he is airing vocally, that is definitely new and noticeable. Okay, so I only have about two minutes left then. What should we expect from our government in terms of how they manage that going forward? Is it more of the same? Should they be changing course? They seem to think the strategy is working. At least that's what the PM said yesterday. Well, they're going to, I guess, as long as there are NAFTA negotiations, they're going to hope that American interests that should and will feel threatened by the threats that Trump is making against Canada start working into the system because it's beyond our lobbying efforts at this point. Well, and there was one good thing, I guess, with the kids in, that were being detained this week, we saw that the president can back down, can, can yeah. submit to some pressure. Maybe not entirely, but the, that, that could work. Yeah, I think our best strategy remains play for time. Uh, keep talking, keep smiling. Until try he and, leaves? Hey? Until he leaves? Well, <laughs> un, un, until something happens. I mean, the, 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 the time is your friend. Uh, there's no sense, we have no incentive to bring things to a head. We want to keep things keep things talking. And if if it does collapse, it has to be with at their instigation rather than ours. Um, and just, yeah, just, you know, to, to the extent that you can, try not to be provoked. At the same time, you know, I don't think Canadians want our leaders also to be tiptoeing around and not saying things that need to be said, but it's a question of being politic. But if those auto sector tariffs come, that isn't that not a warning shot? I mean, at that it's, point, yeah. That's more than a warning shot. Yeah. That's the war. I mean, that's the worst. Yeah. But it's going to take a bit of the American auto industry down with it. Yeah. So I'm not sure it's sustainable from their perspective. No. Althea. 
I think you got a sense of that when Peter Navarro, the trade advisor, was on Fox and part of his tirade, he talked about how the American media should pay attention to the Canadians taking over their system. And he aired a grievance that clearly uh, you know, stung for the White House, which is Canada's actually been successful in talking to state governors, talking to congressmen, talking to the American media and airing that case publicly about how this is going to cost you jobs yeah. too. And I think that message obviously is resonating and that's the track we need to take. Okay, we're going to take a little break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about what the next year and a bit looks like because we are just that close to a federal election and we're going to take some of your questions. We'll be back just right after this. Stick around. So the House has risen, MPs are back in their writings to do the work that they do during the summer, lots of barbecues. When we come back, when that issue comes back, we will be about a year away uh, from the election when we come back in September. So we were asking all of you, what should the leaders be thinking about? Lots of questions, we chose a few of them, let's start. Uh, Donna Vols asks this question of all of you. Will we get real pharmacare from the Liberals or what he qualifies as the watered down version Morneau brought out after the budget? Will they tell us which version before election day, or will this be like voting reform? So oh. Chantelle already is <laughs> upset with the question. Okay. So will, will, will we get pharmacare at all? I guess we could start there. Uh, I'd be astonished if they can do it in time. Uh, I think they will probably opt for something more modest than that parliamentary committee recommended of a single payer, first dollar coverage. Um, for one thing, you're dealing with the provinces, and that's always a, a hornet's nest, but you're also dealing with a $10 billion private industry that I don't think they want to push out in the run-up to an election. Uh, I, I understand the pharmacare for real and the, yes. the other thing, yes. but we've played that game with childcare. If it's not all of it, uh, then there should nothing. be nothing of it. No. And here we are, my son was one year old the last time, that, or the first time a government said we're doing childcare. Right. So at some point, I'm guessing if we were going to have this discussion, maybe you want the government to take a bite. Uh, How old is your son now? He's just had his third kid, so. <laughs> so, so it's taken it a while. Okay. Uh, so I would say we are going to have a watered down version to quote uh, the viewer. Yes. Um, Eric Hoskins was actually standing right here earlier this week, and he's the guy that the government has appointed to head this panel to consult on what the government would basically promise in the next election. So they're supposed to report back in the spring, and he talked about a gap, how to fix the gap. So that pretty much neglects any universal program, like the NDP said, at its convention mm -hmm. that they were gonna champion. Okay, next question comes from Andrew Zettel. Has Andrew Shear's focus on the positive conservative vision been enough to counter Trudeau's comparing him to Stephen Harper? Ask her. Okay. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that focus because we mostly see the leader of the opposition in the question period and you wouldn't call it positive uh, or much of a vision. But his personality uh, and his approach to dealing with issues going on Tout le monde en parle in Quebec uh, has made that comparison, I think, uh, very hard. Looking at the by-election they just won in Quebec, Mr. Scheer will never suffer from a comparison to Stephen Harper in Quebec. Yeah. And just the passage of time. I mean, it's one thing to raise that issue six months or a year after the last election, but by 2019, I don't think that's going to wear very well. With I think it depends the tone he takes on certain issues, like the asylum seekers, for example. Then he risks being branded in a certain way, and they don't really have a coherent message on that. And in some ways, they're talking about being more compassionate, and at the same time, they're saying, don't come across the border. I think the big key for the Conservatives is really going to be candidate recruitment, and we saw what a difference that can make in Smyrna Fiacol. Okay, this I week. want to do two more questions. I've only got four minutes. Cyrus, <laughs> Cyrus. Chris E. asks this, will Jagmeet Singh be the NDP leader next year? Probably, because they can't afford another leadership convention, and it would be very messy. Although we did see what happened to Stockwell Day, but Stockwell Day, who did not do well as federal leader, did not adjust, still had one campaign before bad things happened to him. There's a lot of rumblings, but I agree with Chantal. It's a short period of time to have to replace a leader. I think they're stuck with him. Yes, he will be the leader in the next election. He won with 90% of the vote. Will he be the leader after the next election? Okay, not the resounding <laughs> endorsement he may have been looking for. Um, do the Tories need to have a substantial environmental plan going into the 2019 election? 
I would say yes. I believe it's a branding issue for younger voters in particular. And they, on this, uh, as they push the carbon tax uh, matter against Justin Trudeau, are branding themselves more and more as not interested in the environment. So if it's not something that is more than the back of an envelope, uh, people will see through it. Sorry, that was from Aline Varani. I want to give you credit, Aline. That was your question. I'd love to be able to say that they have to have a comprehensive plan. I don't think they do, though. You know, Doug Ford mm -hmm. won amongst millennials in that Ontario election. I'm not as persuaded that Canadians and even younger Canadians are walking the walk as much as they're talking the talk on this. People like the, the sound of it, but when it gets down to brass tacks, I don't think people are really heavily invested in, in action. I think as long as they have something that looks like action, I'm afraid to say that's probably enough. Uh, I don't think so either. I think the Doug Ford is the perfect example. Though if the Liberals actually get their act together and the price on carbon kicks in uh, before the end of the year and people are getting checks in provinces like Ontario, like Saskatchewan, then, then it's harder to say nope. Yeah. You can't have the NDP falling apart, which we seem to be suggesting, and suggesting that all those voters are just going to stay home or go vote for the Conservatives absent a serious environmental policy. There is that reality, too. It didn't play in Ontario because the dynamics were different. Okay, last question is from at Rosie Barton. See what I did there? Uh, <laughs> one thing you would watch for, one thing that you will watch for as, as, a, as a sign that they are ramping up or they're changing their strategy or something in the next year to get ready for this election and that they have, a, have some sort of strategy for winning it. When you say they... they anyone, any yeah. of the parties, a sign from any of them about where they're headed. Well, I mean, the, the, the Conservatives have their policy convention in August. That's going to be an interesting bell whether, whether they just want to sort of sit back and let the government defeat itself, as oftentimes people are counseled, or whether they're actually going to produce something, uh, an alternative uh, proposal. I only have a minute. I think we've already seen a shift in the liberal strategy. Uh, and um, it was interesting when Justin Trudeau did the pipeline, the Trump, uh, the commentators uh, in French and English said, this is the grown-up version of the prime minister. Uh, different tone, uh, less sunny ways, a bit more, more down to business. And no more India trips. No, more. no, that'll never happen again. I think we've already seen it. Uh, Justin Trudeau is in British Columbia today. It's going to be a key part in the 2019 election. I agree. It's going to be very interesting to see how the Conservatives decide, how do the membership decide to strategize for the next election, and frankly, if Andrew Shear listens to them. Okay. Thank you. It's been a good first season. I survived, mostly because of all of you. Uh -huh. So thank, thank you. you we'll see you. Me. I may have to call you in August, but otherwise you can take July off. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that issue for this week. Thanks, everybody. As you might already know, the Ad Issue podcast debuted this season. That's where we put bonus topics and everything else we talk about when the cameras stop rolling. It'll be back next season. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, and our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Okay, as we go to break, let's take a moment for a very different kind of story. Remembering a world-famous gorilla. Her name was Coco, and she made people question what really separates humans from animals. Cat gorilla have visit. Coco love. Good. She'd like to have another cat visit. Coco was said to have mastered a version of American Sign Language, learning more than a thousand hand signs. Project Coco began in 1972 when Dr. Francine Patterson undertook a study of the language capabilities of apes. Coco's bond with the animal psychologist lasted all of her 46 years and revealed more than intelligence. Tender friendships with kittens challenged notions of animal savagery, and one cat's death reportedly plunged her into depression until she met Robin Williams. Skeptics have suggested Coco was just imitating her trainer. Bad for your teeth. See? Teeth? Bad for your teeth, then Coco signs teeth. But the Gorilla Foundation said this about her legacy. Coco touched the lives of millions as an icon for interspecies communication and empathy. Well, today, a new superhero swooped into the Marvel Comics universe. She's from Nunavut, and she's Inuk. She was the brainchild of a Toronto writer who himself is not indigenous, but he made sure the character was true to her Inuit background. Here's an eye-catching look at the origin of Snowguard. <laughs> when
one of the things they used to say is that Marvel is the world outside your window. You know, we don't go to Metropolis and Gotham, it's New York City. These are real places, and the heroes, you want to be able to imagine that they exist in the here and now. But even then, the majority of the heroes, whether it's Captain America, Iron Man, you know, the Hulk, the ones that were in the absolute forefront seemed to be very much, you know, white and male. There's so much more out there to tell and to show. You know, we are a more connected world, more than ever before. And understanding that and being able to show that it inspires people in all kinds of ways. I'm Jim Zub and I'm a comic book writer. And, and every time I say that, I can't help but smile. <laughs> When you start working in the Marvel Universe, one of the biggest joys is to make new things. And so I wanted to make a new teen hero, and I thought, wouldn't it be neat if we took the Nook myth, if we took, you know, kind of the myth of people from Nunavut and empowering a character with that kind of mythic ability. And I put the idea out to my editors, and I said, I need to dig deeper. I need to do more research. And uh, a good friend of mine put me in touch with Nyla, and that's when things really started to click. Yeah, my name is Nyla Nookshuk and I'm a film and virtual reality producer. When I heard from Marvel that they wanted an Inuk superhero, I was just so excited. I was also nervous about representation and authenticity. I think that indigenous people are kind of tired of being consultants on our culture for other people that want to use it. So what is exciting is actually being able to write story and be a part of that process. So by kind of being brought on at the very beginning, it made me think like, okay, yeah, they're actually making an effort to do this right. So, what's new? You good? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm really good. You know, Nyla and I talked about teen experiences, the things that she felt growing up and the fears that she had. We talked about the difficulties of growing up in that very kind of closed community. Even though it is on a superhero level, it reflects um, the real life feeling of uh, lack of understanding of your identity. This idea that she's sort of trying to find herself between tradition and the modern world. Yeah. And I think that those tattoos really help. In a nook culture, there in the past was uh, this tradition of women getting tattoos on their face, on their hands, on their fingers. And it's uh, become a real powerful kind of emotional symbol for a lot of Inuit women that want to show that connection to the past. So we designed a set of tattoos for Amka. And it's part of her beauty. It's part of what makes her who she is. It's important uh, at this time to have strong female uh, role models for indigenous people. The issue of missing murdered indigenous women and girls is probably uh, more front and center than it ever has been. So to have girls in a power position and you know fighting the bad guys, we felt was a really strong message to be sending. Amka is she wants to be a modern teenager, but she doesn't want to lose the traditions of her people. And then everything changes when she gets imbued with this power, this thing called Sila. It's like kind of mana or magical energy of the North. She can't escape the traditions because now it's part of her. She can't escape the North because it flows through her. And I think a lot of people struggle with tradition and a modern life. That's a classic Marvel story right there. Internal conflict. That's the kind of stuff that makes a superhero. Pretty cool to see the process there. A very visual story to say the least, and there's lots more to see, by the way, on our Instagram page. Breathtaking images every day at CBC The National. Tonight on The National, a new show for the cast and crew of Roseanne. ABC says it'll be airing a spin-off of the hit sitcom this fall, but without its star, Roseanne Barr. You'll recall the reboot of the show was canceled less than a month ago after Roseanne made a racist tweet, but it was a big loss. The show was a huge moneymaker, the highest rated series on TV. So now the spin-off of the reboot is tentatively being called The Connors, 
and it'll follow the rest of the family. In Missouri, a particularly heart-wrenching day for the family of the late fashion designer, Kate Spade. Not only did they lay her to rest today, they were also grieving the death of her father, who died yesterday. The family said in a statement that the 89-year-old had been ill, but also that he was devastated by his daughter's suicide. Also tonight, news that high-profile conservative commentator and Pulitzer Prize winner Charles Krauthammer has died. He was 68, a longtime columnist with The Washington Post, and he had a strong Canadian connection. His family moved to Montreal when he was five, and he studied at McGill. Krauthammer revealed earlier this month that the cancer he was being treated for had spread, and he had only weeks to live. He also wrote a farewell column, thanking his supporters and saying, I'm grateful to have played a small role in the conversations that have helped guide this extraordinary nation's destiny. I leave this life with no regrets. One basketball player from Hamilton, Ontario, just saw his NBA dreams come true tonight. Shea Gilgis Alexander was drafted 11th overall. The 19-year-old is just the latest young Canadian talent to make it to the heights of professional basketball, and so he's our moment of the day. He's a 6'6 Canadian born point guard who played for the Kentucky Wildcats. With the 11th pick in the 2018 NBA Draft, the Charlotte Hornets select Shea Gilgis Alexander from Hamilton, Canada and the University of Kentucky. This pick might be on, on the move right now as we check in with Woj. Woj, what are you hearing? Yeah, uh, Charlotte has agreed to a deal to send Shea Gildas Ale Alexander to the Clippers. Being able to play in the NBA in itself is a blessing and something that not a lot of kids get to get to experience. And me being one of them is, is an amazing feeling. Well, and a little context here. I mean, he calls it a, a blessing. So I was actually shocked to learn that he was cut from his junior team on, on his high school's basketball team in, in grade nine because he wasn't all that good. He had to play on the midget team. Uh, so, you know, perseverance, <laughs> practice makes perfect. Uh, and he, he has some skills here that are just biological. He's 6'6", and this fascinates both Andrew and I, 6'11", wingspan. So, like, <laughs> that's, that's a big dunk. You can go really far away and get it in, I think. And, and, and can, you know, his coach says uh, poise is his greatest strength, but can we just show his, his outfit again? Because I think his fashion sense has to be the great... I mean, look at that. It's a, it's a floral suit, I guess, but, but that doesn't seem to do it justice, does it? No, he's, uh, <laughs> he's doing good there. He's going to fit right in the NBA. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's The National for this Thursday, June 21st. Have a good night. Good night.